So we're talking about theories of sight. And our view in this symposium has been very, actually quite broad. Rather than getting into too much into specific theories, we're discussing how can we go about uh, building a theory altogether, and what are the criteria that we need in order to do that. And I'm going to just share a little. Since we started with a picture for the first session which was this one, I'm going to remind us of that. And the, po the point there was that one of the things that we're very interested in is, is to gather what we know from data that can help guide us and constrain our theories or give us indications of where we need to go. And uh, one of the things that was coming out of the first session is that we need to expand our view. And there's a notion from physics from, that goes back to about the 1980s maybe a little bit before, that's interesting in this regard. And that's the notion of symmetry. And um, in nature, we see symmetry all the time. And you see symmetry in plants and we're symmetric. We have a kind of a symmetry. Symmetry appears in nature a lot because it's actually a very easy way to build things if you build things symmetrically. But there's another aspect of symmetry that's particularly interesting in physics, which is helpful when we describe how more complicated things arise. And it's the notion of breaking the symmetry. So there's an idea in physics that's called spontaneously broken symmetry, which is a, a notion that led to theories, both of how fundamental forces come and arise, but also how such complicated things in the world uh, pertaining to dynamical systems appear like earthquakes and self-organizing systems of, of insects and things like that. And what we've seen in the past session, one way was how we can bring symmetry in to our theories to expand them. So Patricia and Daniel were talking about expanding, uh, expanding the symmetry of time. And once you do that, you allow different possibilities of thinking. And the unus mundus uh, notion that Marcus was t telling us about, really it says that there there's can be an underlying symmetry to conscious experience and, and sort of the actuality of physical experience. But when things really get interested, interesting is when those symmetries get, get broken. So one of, the, one of the things that we can get from the experimental data, one of the things that the, the experimentalist can say to the theorist is to, is to look for those, those broken symmetries. And perhaps one of the most, most the deepest uh, symmetry breakings that we experience is the difference between our individuality and some sense that there's everything all connected. And that's a kind of a my own take on some of the ideas that we're going to discuss in this session. And I have a picture to show you a notion of that that I like. So I thought I would share it with you. And that is this picture, which is an odd uh, symbol. It's actually a symbol that was um, on the cover of a really interesting 1905 edition. I mean, actually, it's interesting that it's 1905 because that was kind of a pretty important and interesting year for physics. But this was a, uh, an edition of the Rubyat of Omar Khayyam, Edward Fitzgerald's translation that was re-edited. And this symbol was put on the cover of that book. And, and you can look at it and make what you will of it. But uh, it does have to do something with the coming together of, of body and, and and conscious experience and some kind of unity of the soul and how those things interact and how they are not quite perfectly symmetrical when the full you know display of, of phenomena comes out and so the wild and woolly nature of our uh, psychic world uh, is one way we can look at it is as there's some underlying symmetry that is is broken and from that crack comes all kinds of amazing phenomena that's just a thought uh, that you can keep in mind as you listen to the talks in this session 
So where we're going to begin um, is to go back to some uh, a more psychological way of looking at and understanding uh, Psi experiences. And so I would like to introduce uh, Jim Carpenter, who is going to give the first talk. And uh, so Jim is a clinical psychologist and an experimental parapsychologist at uh, Chapel Hill in North Carolina. He, Carolina. He's formerly a professor at the University of North Carolina, and he has also has an active uh, practice in psychotherapy. And he's been working in parapsychology for many years, since 1959, when he attended uh, Duke University. And he was drawn to that because there was a laboratory studying parapsychology there at Duke. And his work and field has mostly involved the study of the psychological processes that mediate the expression of psi. And he will talk to us today about the sort of the full blown uh, uh, synthesis of his ideas that he calls the first sight uh, theory of psi. And the title of his talk is First Sight, a Psychological Theory of Psi, or as you see on the screen, Psi is not a psychological anomaly. So, Jim, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. I'm um, happy to, to be here and uh, I wish I could be seeing everyone in person. I'm very glad we're meeting like this about um, the important question of theory in parapsychology. The title of my talk today is taken from a review of Daryl Bim of my book, First Sight. Um, Psi is not a psychological anomaly. In that book, and today I'm going to sketch for you a theory for Psi. That includes ESP and psychokinesis and a category I think of as a blend, which is healing and other somatic psi effects um, that we can think of as either expressive psi like ESP or a lot more expressive psi like psychokinesis or receptive psi like ESP, depending upon how we think about it. We have a literature with many thousands of well done studies. We have a paucity of theory to guide them and interpret them. And all of these studies have developed in the context of really very little theory. A large proportion of that literature addresses psychological questions and our most robust findings are psychological in nature. So we need better psychological theory. Here, a little list of things we commonly understand about Psy. One is that it's absent from everyday life for most people. So we wonder if it actually exists. It's unpredictable and unreliable. It's anomalous. It's limited to a few special people or circumstances. It's intrinsically inscrutable. If it does actually exist, where could Psy be hiding? Since everyday life doesn't seem to show it to us very much. First sight theory. It's a psychological theory. It's based on the accumulated core research and mainstream research in related areas, cognition, emotion, memory, creativity, personality, and the neurophysiological level of psychological processes. First side theory assumes that psi and related unconscious processes is intrinsically unconscious. And it is going on all the time for everyone. The implication is that this isn't rare or exotic, but is actually constantly present at an unconscious level. This unconscious connection with reality goes on prior to conscious experience, so it is first sight. There are two guiding analogies to this theory. 
we assume that psi functions like subliminal or suboptimal perception. And we assume that PK functions like other unconsciously expressive behavior. For this talk, I'll focus on ESP. Subliminal perception, it's not just a weird way to manipulate people. It really goes on all the time. It's a constant uh, preface to all of our experience. It primes experience and behavior, things we don't consciously see or experience yet um, act as primes. It primes emotional experience, it primes the formation of perceptions and thoughts, and it primes behaviors. And we have a very large mainstream literature that shows us a whole lot about how this happens. What's subliminal perception for? Very few mainstream researchers actually seem to ask this question, at least in print. But I think it's safe to say that it precedes all of our experience and behavior and helps to shape them. It has a guiding function. How does subliminal perception work? A lot's been learned here. For one thing, it works positively when people aren't being too analytical and are not sure of what they are seeing or doing. It tends to go negative when the opposite is true. That is, subliminal perception is bidirectional. Psi is the initial step in the formation of experience. Every bit of experience and behavior has a very rapid unconscious history. For example, the mind makes an unformulated reference to subliminal perceptions, even though they cannot yet be consciously seen or construed. This rapid prehistory of experience actually begins a step earlier with psi, according to our theory, beyond the ordinary boundaries of the organism. This implicit guidance of the development of experience is the basic every moment function of psi. This is why psi isn't second psi, but it's first psi. Common sense reminds us that we cannot see around corners or predict tomorrow's headlines or make things happen just by wishing. So if psi is real, where is it hiding? It's hiding in the most common place you could imagine in every thought. This perspective leads to two big changes in research orientation. Studies will not try to capture psi, they will attempt to reveal it. Assuming that psi is going on all the time in all kinds of ways in every bit of experience, we won't try to bring some exotic anomalous creature into the laboratory and catch it. We will try to develop methods that reveal its unconscious functioning. Studies will relate psi to other unconscious psychological processes. These include long-term memory, subliminal perception, creative problem solving, a number of other things that psychologists have been studying for a long time. First sight theory spells out many hypotheses about how psi works. We want answers to two basic questions. It seems to me the function of our theory should uh, lead us to try to answer two basic questions. What makes a psi response to some information go in a positive or a negative direction? This is the question of direction. As in perception research, a positive response is called assimilation and a negative response is called contrast. Uh, in our literature, we've called it psi hitting and psi missing. What makes us, the second question we wanna ask is, what makes a psi response weak or strong? So a psi response has both direction, it's positive or negative, and it's either weak or strong. What makes it weak or strong? How strong a response is in an experiment affects effect size. In everyday life, the strength of response determines whether or not some connection is obvious enough to be noticed and thought of as possible psi. 
in the briefest nutshell, what theory hypothesizes is that direction is determined by unconscious intention. And extremity is determined by the consistency of unconscious intention. So research will try to determine what things affect unconscious intention and what affects the consistency of unconscious intention. How can we know what unconscious intention is? It's often, but not always, the same as conscious intention. One very common intention is assumed to be the automatic need to keep consciousness singular. We can only be aware of one thing at a time and everything else needs to be excluded. So the most common unconscious intention for Psy is to get out of the way, go invisible, don't interfere, hide. This is why we don't see it happening much. With subliminal primes, this is called the principle of exclusion. A prime will probably be assimilated in a perception if it's congruent with the ideas about the perception that have already formed. It'll tend to be rejected if it's not. Things that affect the direction of unconscious intention. The person's state of mind matters. Moods that are emotionally secure, drifting and relaxed, and strongly motivated are helpful with successful psi expression. Being engaged in cognitive work turns psi negative. Being anxious hurts, usually. The kind of information matters. If the information is threatening, it leads to quicker and stronger physiological response, but slower awareness. If the information is meaningful, it will be expressed more in cognitive processes. For example, task-related or personally important material will be learned more easily. If the information belongs to the same categories as the ones the person is trying to perceive or work on, that is if they're, we'd say they're task relevant, it will be expressed more strongly than if it's in different categories that are irrelevant to the task at hand. If the information comes from a source the person trusts and believes is pertinent, it will, even though unconscious, lead to stronger effect. There's an interesting study by some social psychologists that showed that when people were exposed to subliminal primes and half of the subjects were told that they were from a source, uh, of, they, were, they represented the opinions of an authority in the person's own political party and the other half of the subjects were told that they represented the opinions of an authority in the party they were not affiliated with. And what they found was that the prime showed a positive effect when they believed the source represented their own authority, and they showed a negative effect when they believed that the source of the unconscious primes, too quick to see, uh, represented an authority in the other party. Personality matters. More open-minded people express unconscious primes, including psi, more accurately. More characteristically anxious people do more poorly, except when a physiological response to something threatening is being measured, then they usually do better. More creative people are better. More extroverted people are better if the task is one that permits social approval for success. This is highly motivating for extroverts. What things affect the consistency of unconscious intention and the strength of response? It, how important is the information matters. How imminently will it matter matters. How dangerous is the issue involved matters. How congruent with dominant intentions of the person is the information? Is the person focused on an immediate sensory and cognitive task? How stable and integrated are the person's intentions generally? Is the person in a galvanizing emotional state? Galvanizing emotional states are assumed to bring intentions together 
very strongly for, for that moment. An example of the power of theory to interpret and integrate. Does fear facilitate a psi response or inhibit it? For our little field, there's a fairly large number of studies on this question, basically correlating measures of, of ESP with measures of anxiety, neuroticism, the fearfulness of the targets and so forth. And many strong effects have been reported, but they've been inconsistent in direction. So when we take our theory and apply it to this inconsistency, first side proposes that psi and other implicit cognitive processes should follow similar patterns. This in first sight theory is called the hypothesis of functional equivalence. With subliminal stimuli, fearfulness has been found to facilitate the focus of preconscious attention. It's very quick to draw our attention at a preconscious level to something, the more dangerous it is. It's been found to delay the conscious perception of information. If we ask people to identify the content of the dangerous thing, the more dangerous it is, the slower they'll be to know exactly what it is. ESP tasks requiring no conscious perception, requiring no conscious perception show a positive relationship between fearfulness, anxiety, dangerousness, and so forth. So if we measure things like uh, galvanic skin response or um, um, a heart rate or other other uh, physiological measures of non-conscious response, we find a nice positive relationship. The more the anxiety, the more the danger, the stronger the response. On the other hand, this is opposite for tasks involving conscious perception. If we're asking people to identify the content of an ESP target, the more dangerous, the more anxious and so forth, the more poorly they will do. New research guided by first sight. Both of these studies developed the first sight assumption that psi implicitly guides everyday experience. One looked at the experience of preferences among pictures. The other studied the spontaneous development of interpersonal behavior in a group. The first pair of studies, psi guides the experience of a preference. The first pair of studies looked at subliminal perception and the ESP at the same time. We assumed that ESP would function like subliminal perception, so we set up a mere exposure effect, a preference for pre-exposed material with covered targets as well as subliminally presented targets. We assumed a bidirectional expression of the mere exposure effect. We examined variables specified by first sight theory to be important in ESP, openness to inner life, freedom from fear, positive mood, tolerance for merger with others. We found strong predicted relationships. When we bundled these relationships together in multiple regression and uh, created a predictive equation and we carried this prediction to another independent sample and replicated our relationships nicely. The second study uh, examines whether or not psi guides conversation and behavior in a group. It's a long study on the implicit expression of ESP target in spontaneous social interaction. We assume that ESP information is accessed unconsciously and expressed inadvertently, but can be um, recognized after the fact and um, braided. Almost 400 undirected sessions of a small group were carried out while an ESP target was being selected elsewhere. We tried to implicitly express and then identify the target out of a field of decoys after each session. We were quite successful at this. Success meaningfully related to the rated quality of group interaction. Basically, sessions that were more playful and less emotionally intense had more success. This is consistent with the expectation that pressing work leads to disemployment of irrelevant psi information. Let's return to some common beliefs. 
If psi isn't bogus, it's miraculous. No, psi is real and ordinary. Psi is rare. Psi, and no, psi is constant. It's unpredictable. No, it's quite lawful. It's anomalous. No, it behaves consistently. It requires special people and circumstances. No, everybody uses it all the time. It's unreliable. No, it's extremely helpful. It's inscrutable. No, it can be revealed with normal methods. Psi is not a psychological anomaly. For more information about this point of view, please check out the book, First Sight, ESP and Parapsychology in Everyday Life. Thank you.